Welcome to episode 11 of the Go Get Em Agility podcast. My name is Margaret Hughes and I'm your host. Today I'd like to talk about the difference between dog training versus handling training and how handlers can recognize the difference. Also, how you can test to see if it is a dog training problem versus a handling problem and then deciding how to handle a certain scenario to the benefit of your dog. In agility, there is always an element of dog training that is going on, uh, teaching the dog certain skills to then be able to move around a course. But there's also handling skills that are trained for the handler. And sometimes I think that what is a handling problem it gets blamed on the dog. So I want to talk a little bit about how to recognize when you've got a dog training problem and when you've got a handling problem. So in an agility course, when the dog is uh, required to turn a certain uh, degree or run forward a certain um, a distance from the handler, there's dog training elements that are part of that. So the dog's just learning how to to jump and learning how to uh, navigate uh, running towards a tunnel. It's very dependent on what you've actually trained, how far away you can be from your dog in any given scenario and fighting with the difference between a trained behavior and a dog's natural behavior. So it's important to recognize all the behaviors in dogs that is natural that we use to our benefit in agility, but that are natural behaviors. So one of them is, and this is, and I'm talking about dogs that are in focus, that are um, running with you and, and listening to the handler, but may not have the specific skills required um, to pull off a certain uh, uh, sequence. So this is what I'm talking about, is natural behaviors are dogs always want to turn in towards their owner. So when they are looking for information, they will turn towards their owners either for a physical, a visual cue, or they will listen to their owners for an auditory verbal cue. And so if a dog starts to get in front of a handler, on any given sequence, they're going to start to turn towards their handler. Their location is going to navigate them back towards the handler. And if the handler doesn't intervene with handling training, then the dog will eventually curl right back to them or encircle them um, like a like a border collie herding sheep. So they will navigate back towards their handler. So that's one very natural behavior. The other natural behavior is that they will navigate towards your uh, face, towards your eyes. Um, they are, from, from puppyhood, <laughs> we encourage our dogs to work in front of us, to look towards us, just naturally. That's what we do as human beings. Like, hey puppy, sit. And the pup comes in front of us and they look up at us towards our face not at our feet, right? But they look up towards our face and perform a, a, a variety of, of behaviors in front of us. So in obedience, your front is your, the dog's nose facing towards your knees or facing towards your belly button. And in general, because dogs are smaller than us uh, or lower than us, rather, um, they're looking up, look, looking up at our face. And in a lot of obedience classes and a lot of puppy classes, we actually train them to look at our face and reward them uh, for looking at our face. So dogs on course, when they're in an agility run, they're naturally going to look towards our face. It's just a natural thing for them to do. So those are two variables that we have to pay attention to as handlers that when we are training a course, we are always either using those natural cues to our benefit 
or trying to counteract them to get our dogs to either run straight or turn away from us. Um, so those are two natural cues. There are other natural cues. There are lots of other natural cues. Um, them chasing us, for the most part, dogs chasing us, them wanting to chase us is a very natural cue um, versus them driving away from us is not a natural cue. That would be a trained behavior for the most part in agility. And one other natural cue is our location relative to our dog. And I kind of touched on this already that if we're asking our dogs to drive away from us on a straight line of obstacles, that is unnatural. Therefore, the opposite is them staying close to us or within a certain bubble is also a natural behavior for dogs. And so our relation of or our, our location towards our dogs in relation to the obstacles around us can help them or hinder them in our training. And so this is where dog training versus handling training starts to come into play. So here's what I wanna look at, is when we are running a given sequence, our location and our speed dictate how uh, big our dogs jump or the direction that our dogs jump in relation to the obstacles. So another natural behavior is our location and our location in relation to our dog and our location in relation to an obstacle. So, and I mentioned this uh, prior that if we're asking our dogs to run straight over a, a line of obstacles, them running away from us is not a natural behavior. So them gaining more location distance away from us is a trained behavior, not a natural behavior. And so when we're looking at how we as handlers run a course, we have to look at the overall, uh, overall picture of what is natural to a dog and what is trained. And our training, whatever we've trained, we have to continue to train that over the duration of the dog. Some things will stay with the dog. They'll, they'll, you can train it once and they're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Other things you can train it and then it starts to fall apart again. And so we have to continually put tape on whatever part of the training to keep it intact or keep it at the level that we want it. And that's not to say that it can't stay at a high level of training for a very long time, but just like human beings, once you leave school and once you leave the practice of, of doing math or of doing, um, I don't know, I don't, whatever you studied, whatever you studied, if you don't use it, you lose it. I mean, that's a, a well-known say, saying, use it or lose it. Uh, and so that's same with our agility training, that if we've trained something, it doesn't mean that we don't go back and, and retrain it, or at least refresh the dog's mind um, on what we have done in the past to then continue handling. All right, so let's look at a couple of scenarios where dog training needs to happen in order for a course to run successfully. Uh, and and there's so, this is a huge topic. This is a huge, huge topic. And we could literally go on for hours of all the different scenarios that are out there for agility training on what is dog training versus what is handler training. And what is natural uh, dog training, so things that come naturally to the dog versus of what we have to train and how we can help our dogs with a, using their natural behaviors uh, versus training it um, or, or sorry, not, 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 <laughs> let me slow down, but not, not training something, but using the natural cues and also training other agility handling cues for the dog so that we can blend them together and use them effectively on course. All right, so here's one of the scenarios, is when we are running a course, our location in relation to when we want a turn matters. And this is where, do I do a front cross? Do I do 
a blind cross, do I do a rear cross, starts to kick in. And so we have to look at any given scenario of what is going to cause the dog to go this direction or a different direction or the direction that we want. So let me see if I can explain this verbally on a podcast as opposed to with, with diagrams. So this is a little complicated, so stick with me here. And feel free to uh, let me know in the comments if, if this doesn't make sense to you, because it's definitely important. And I want to convey how important dog training is versus handling training. So here's the scenario. Uh, if we're running a line of jumps with a gentle bend to a, 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 a discrimination between a tunnel and a contact obstacle. So we're running a line of jumps and we need the dog to come in towards us to take a tunnel as opposed to a, the A-frame that is also right there in their face. So as we come over the jump prior to the discrimination, the two obstacles of either the tunnel or the contact obstacle are going to become present to our dog. And the choice is that we can either pull our dog in towards us, so, so like a tunnel throttle or a, a, a discrimination throttle. So pull our dogs in towards us. And the desired obstacle, by the way, is the tunnel. So we're going jump, jump on a bend, jump, jump into the discrimination tunnel versus contact obstacle. And we want the tunnel. So we put our dogs over the first jump. The second jump, as they come over that jump, they're going to be presented with our discrimination. So our choices are, we pull our dogs into us and uh, cue the, the tunnel, or we do a front cross between the second jump and the, the tunnel uh, contact discrimination, or we do a blind cross between the jump and the tunnel contact discrimination. So let's look at the, the various styles of what we need to pull off all three of those. So technically you could pull off all three of those, right? If they're trained. So here's the things that we, uh, that come natural to the dog. Number one, if we run to the landing side of the jump, so run between the jump and the discrimination, by the mere fact that we are running uh, to the landing side of the jump, just the mere fact that we're going to the landing side of the jump, without other trained skills, the dog is going to jump that jump in more extension than if you had stayed on the takeoff side of the jump. Does that make sense? <laughs> So our motion, our location, moving to the landing side of the jump. So now we're in between the jump and the, the tunnel contact discrimination. The mere fact that we have moved to that location without other training in place, that will tell our dog to jump the jump with more extension than if we stay on the takeoff side. So if we send our dogs to that jump and stay on the takeoff side of the jump and as the dog lands, without any other training in place, the mere location of us on the takeoff side of the jump should indicate to our dogs to turn just natural that's using the dog's natural behavior so moving to the t landing side of a jump will pull the dog with us and will encourage them to um, extend out a little bit more than if we send them to the jump or stay on the takeoff side of the jump then they are more likely to add a stride in before takeoff and jump it in relative collection or in a collected state rather than an extension state. So let me just clarify, extension is um, uh, opening the body up. So jumping bigger and takeoff 
the takeoff is bigger and the landing is bigger because the dog is moving forward and not preparing to turn. So they're jumping almost in a straight line as opposed to preparing for a turn. So when a dog turns, they have to lower their body. They have to add a stride in to make a turn. And so the mere fact that of, of our location dictates whether or not they jump big or whether or not they collect and jump uh, shorter or smaller. They, they jump more upright as opposed to uh, flat if that makes sense. They still keep the bar up, but they're jumping flatter in their arc rather than more rounded in their arc. All right, so with, the, with that information in mind, that going to the landing side of a jump will pull our dog over the jump further and faster, and staying on the takeoff side of the jump will slow our dogs down for a turn, not necessarily slow our dogs down, but they'll add in a stride, right? They will prepare for a tighter jump. So with that mere information in mind, do you have the information that you need to be able to get the turn strong enough for the tunnel throttle as opposed to the dog extending and being in line with the contact obstacle? All right, so how can we do let's go let's go one cross at a time so let's start with the rear cross so if we are to do a rear cross into the tunnel so we're going jump jump uh, pulling our dog for the tunnel doing a rear cross after they enter the tunnel or after they commit to the tunnel so for the rear cross the natural cue for the dog is that our location is relative to the turn. So our location is on the landing side of, sorry, scratch that. Our location is on the takeoff side of the jump, which will naturally cause a turn. But then here come the trained elements of the scenario. The dog has to be trained to converge on your hand and then turn away from you for the tunnel. So even though you may have taught a tunnel and you may have taught a tunnel on a bend, you may have taught a tunnel on a straight line, is have you taught a tunnel with the dog turning away from you to get into it? So the unnatural behavior is a dog turning away. Remember earlier, I said that the natural behavior for a dog is to turn into their handlers. This is important because turning away from us is not natural. It is trained. And this is a dog training problem that if you have not trained a dog to turn away from you and then go into all types of tunnels, short, long, dark, curved, all of those variables have to be trained before you can put it into this course. So while you may get the bend and the pull naturally, the turning away from you for the tunnel threadle or the tunnel rear cross is not natural. And that has to be trained. So we have to recognize what is a dog training problem and what is a handler training problem or what is a natural versus dog training issue. And so I've see, I, I see this all the time where the handler gets the turn and then they go to cue the tunnel and the dog's like, I have no clue how to do a tunnel like that. And the handler is confused because they do tunnels all the time in class, but they're not doing rear cross tunnels or they're not doing rear cross tunnels to a macaroni 20 foot dark tunnel. That is a different kettle of fish for a new dog. For a dog who has never done a rear cross into a 20 foot macaroni shaped tunnel, it is difficult. Not only that, the direction that you are coming from also needs to be trained in all of the different angles. So coming at the macaroni tunnel straight is one training scenario. Having them come 
directly across from the exit of the tunnel and then turn away from you to go into the macaroni tunnel that's another scenario or vice versa coming from the uh, so if, a, if you've got a macaroni tunnel and you're not anywhere near the exits but you're coming from the opposite side of the tunnel and doing a rear cross into a macaroni tunnel again a different a, a scenario for the dog that must be trained it is not natural all right so so far with the rear cross we have three elements that are a dog training problem for a tunnel throttle number one converging in on the handler and coming towards the dogs sorry coming towards the handler either coming towards their hand signal or coming towards them on a verbal is a trained behavior then doing rear crosses on tunnels is a trained behavior and then doing rear crosses on all sizes shapes and colors of tunnels is a trained behavior oh and let me add a fourth thing doing rear crosses on all sizes shapes colors and location coming from all the different locations possible while doing a rear cross at the same time those are all dog training uh, scenarios and let's throw in one more the handler training part of that is understanding when to pull them in and when to release them so you can pull your dog into you uh, getting them to do a tunnel throttle and hold them for so long that an obstacle behind you or adjacent to your uh, your opposite uh, uh, side to the dog starts to come into play so if you hold them too long then you take them off the line for the tunnel so there's this this element that of, of learning when to pull the dog in how long to hold them in that convergence and then when to release them to the tunnel to make it effective and some people the mere fact of them pulling their dog into a tunnel throttle also indicates go take the tunnel don't look for anything else and so you can have a specific tunnel verbal cue that means don't pay attention to anything any other obstacle but when I say this word, we'll say uh, come. So when I say come, come, you come into me, then go find the opposite end of the tunnel. But that's trained. That is 100% dog training. And in, while you're training that, the natural behaviors of location, motion, eye contact are going to override the verbal until the verbal overrides the natural behaviors all right so that was discussing the rear cross option for my jump jump tunnel contact discrimination scenario here i hope you're able to visualize this because it i see it very clearly in my head but i hope that i am i'm painting a picture that helps you see what i'm talking about all right, let's talk about the front cross versus the blind cross or or not versus but let's talk about the front cross the the natural behaviors of the front cross and then the uh, unnatural behaviors that must be trained the dog training part of uh, the front cross and then the handling training part of the front cross all right so by definition we are in front of our dogs when we are doing a front cross and so in order to put in a front cross from our jump to our discrimination our tunnel throttle uh, contact discrimination we have to be in front of our dogs uh, that so that means that we are naturally on the landing side of the jump that we're coming from and here's an important thing to know so not all front crosses and the the sequence are equal so 
all front crosses, all blind crosses, all rear crosses, for the most part, they can all happen on different angles. And so some, and this is one of the reasons that some are better than others for certain sequences, because some angles are harder to pull off a front cross or a rear cross or a blind cross. Uh, so for our front cross, when we are doing a front cross or a blind cross, for the most part, the location that we put the front cross and the blind cross is in general, closer to the obstacle we're going towards. So in this case, the it, it's jump to the tunnel. And so the front cross would happen closer in line with the tunnel rather than the jump. But there's always exceptions to the rule and this tunnel dog uh, tunnel uh, uh, contact discrimination may just be one of those rules so the closer that we get to the line of the contact obstacle the more because we have to be on the landing side of the jump the more likely we are opening that up as a decision for the dog and so the dog training part of the equation here jump to the tunnel is that our chest starts to rotate towards the dog our outside hand should start to come up to indicate to the dog that you're doing a turn and our eye contact these are all natural behaviors or all natural cues our eye contact is indicating to the dog that you're converging on me and so those natural behaviors have to override the other natural behavior, which is the location relative to the contact obstacle. So because we're on the landing side of the jump, we have indicated our dog to uh, jump bigger. And now our hand signal, sorry, our, our, uh, our shoulders, which part of our chest. So our shoulders and our eye contact have to start to override the location. And one of the cues that is not natural to a dog and is a dog training problem is a hand signal. So as our outside hand comes up, that is has to be trained in order for our dog to understand it, in order for them to understand that when this hand comes up, you don't pass behind it. So you don't run past my outside hand that is starting to come up. And so recognizing that the location is indicating the contact obstacle and the only other cues that are not indicating the contact obstacle is our eye contact and our shoulders and chest starting to come towards uh, face our dog. And that that outside hand signal and whatever verbal that you have taught your dog are dog training elements that are going to assist your eye contact and your shoulders because those by themselves likely aren't going to be enough for young dogs to overcome a contact obstacle. So the dog training elements have to be trained. And the dog training elements of a hand signal, so when my outside hand comes up for that front cross, the dog, imagine that you have uh, coming off of your fingertips laser beams, and the dog is not allowed to go through those laser beams, or is not, we want to train them to not go through those laser beams so as to bring them into um, our space, into our convergence zone, so that we could then cue the tunnel. So the dog training part of it is teaching our dogs, pay attention to this hand, pay when it's out, when it is um, uh, out there, it is for you to pay attention to. And we do that by teaching them to come into our hand. We do that in a variety of ways, either um, in easier scenarios so without the contact obstacle there, which is pulling them past our, our hand, uh, but teaching them how to recognize a front cross hand signal and teaching them how to recognize that when the hand is out, 
there will there will be a cookie in there for recall to heal. So come into my recall to heal. So teaching them their hand signals is a dog training part of it. And if you have a dog blasting past your hand without regard for uh, uh, that hand signal cue, then you have a dog training problem. You, you don't have a dog as being um, bad or, or not listening to you. They listen to your location. They drove through that jump as you told them to because you're on the landing side of it. And the, the, the location relative to the contact obstacle gets stronger. So unless they're well-skilled in your shoulders and your eye contact, it may not be enough to not also have some other dog training skills in there of not blasting past your hand. And the other thing as far as them not paying attention to it or not listening to any dog training part of it. So let's assume that you have done some uh, good dog training on your hand signals. You've done good dog training on your eye contact. Then is the timing of the handler well-timed to allow the dog enough time to make the turn? So here's, here's the other thing is as the dog is lifting from that jump, so before they lift, so you're going to run to the landing side with them, but as or before they lift for that jump, do they know a turn is coming? And this is not a dog training problem necessarily. This might be a handling training problem. So dig, did the handler indicate to the dog with enough trained behaviors or enough natural behaviors to let the dog know to add in a stride, prepare for a turn on landing. And if you didn't, then you can't blame your dog for jumping big and then being smack in front of a contact obstacle that you probably also highly trained for whatever contact uh, um, criteria you have. And dogs naturally prefer the contact obstacles to the jumping, in my opinion, because the ratio of reward for contacts versus jumping is much higher on the contact obstacle. So handling problem that the handler didn't give the cues in enough time on the takeoff side of the jump to indicate a turn on the landing side of the jump and all the behaviors that are natural that we want the dog to ignore. So ignore my location in jumping big. So this is where it gets confusing for dogs, right? So they're about to approach the jump. You want to turn. And as they approach the jump, no signals indicate the turn. So your hand hasn't come up. You're not rotating towards your dog. You haven't given a verbal signal that indicates to turn. So in my case, a turning verbal is the dog's name. Uh, you're not looking at the dog. All of those are cues for the dog to add in a stride, prepare for a turn. But if you have not given one of those cues on takeoff, and you're waiting to give all those cues on landing, you're going to get a big, wide turn. And if they're a big enough jumper, they're going to be on that contact obstacle before you ever realize it. So some of our smaller dogs have a little bit more leeway in time, but don't mistake them not needing turning cues on those jumps. Maybe they just don't need them quite as early as our 20 inch jumpers or our 24 inch jumpers. So learning to recognize when the cues need to happen, where the cues need to happen, and what cues need to happen, natural versus trained, is an important part of the equation. All right, so that's the front cross. So the front cross, the, the pros of the front cross is a front cross with the outside hand and the shoulders and the eye contact all rotating towards the dog indicate turning cues. Those are all three turning cues, eye contact, uh, shoulder rotation towards the dog, and hand signals starting to come up. 
But remember that only two of those are natural behaviors. The third one, the hand signal, is an unnatural behavior and it must be trained. The verbal of the dog's name or a come cue or whatever turning cue you use for your dog is another trained behavior. It is not natural for dogs to learn English. We have to teach them what their name means. And if you overuse it, then it's just gonna become noise in an agility run. And those four cues are overriding our location and our motion towards the landing side of the obstacle. All right, let's talk about a blind cross. So all the things that may, that in the front cross that indicated collection or turning a, a turning cue, they are not present in a blind cross. So just by the very nature of the blind cross, the shoulders are facing away from the dog. We lose eye contact for, from the dog for a moment. So we, our eye contact goes forward first and then we pick the dog up again on the blind cross. Those two elements alone are make the forward jumping, the extension jumping on the the jump prior to the discrimination, make that more um, difficult for the handler, make it more difficult for the turn for the dog. Not only that, again, because we need to be in front of our dog for the blind cross, we're generally adding more speed in that moment. And that added speed does what to the dog? Adds more speed to the dog. So that means more speed from the dog generally means a bigger jumping uh, 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 arc, a bigger extension jump from the dog. So in order to pull off a blind cross on a jump to a tunnel contact discrimination, we must, we must, we must give our blind cross side change cue and side change cue are eye contact and new hand signal, new side. So we're going, let's say we're going from our right side to our left side. We have to give that left hand signal and start to give our left sided eye contact before they take the jump prior. So the dog must stay committed to the jump if we're going to give a blind cross cue prior to them actually lifting, right? Because if we give the blind cross cue, they should come up to our new side. But in the dog training part of it is that if I'm in this relative location to the jump, your dog, your, your job, doggy puppy dog, is for you to take the jump and come up to my new side. So there's a dog training part of that because a young dog that's just learning blind crosses and a handler that is just learning how to time their blind crosses, if they give that cue too early, the dog shouldn't take the jump, right? They should come up to that new side. And so a, a, a training a blind cross for a turn as well as a, a discrimination, the timing of that has to be uh, um, taught to the dog and in, in respect to the handler, they have to learn how to time their handling in relation to whatever dog is present with them in, in their training scenario for the dog to recognize I'm this close to the jump, go ahead and take the jump, then perform the blind cross. So to reiterate the difficulties of a jump, jump, tunnel threadle, contact obstacle discrimination, when using a blind cross in that scenario, that the blind cross itself requires us to be in front of our dog. That requires us to go to the landing side of the jump prior to the discrimination, prior to the tunnel threadle. And that movement of us through the plane of the jump to the landing side indicates to our dog to 
jump and extension. The dog training part of it, that's the natural behavior. That's the natural behavior is if we're doing a blind cross and we run through to the landing side of a jump, we are naturally telling our dogs to take that jump in extension. If we want a turn off of that for a tunnel throttle as well, then the timing of our blind cross cues has to be before the dog commits, or sorry, it has to be before the dog takes the jump or decides to go into extension. So we have to show the collection for the turn, but it has to be trained in relation to the jump. Otherwise the dog may pull off early and do the blind cross without the jump involved. So there's so many different intricate parts of dog training versus natural behavior of dogs versus handling training. And so when we are presented with a scenario where our dog is looking like they don't understand that I've called them in to me, looking like they're just in love with whatever contact obstacles in front of them, first look at your location. So I say this to my handlers all the time when we're, when we're looking at their location and how their location affects jumping and how their location affects turning. I will constantly tell my handlers, stop, don't move. <laughs> so don't stop, don't move. Feed your dog. It's generally the scenario that I say. And then I, I want them to see where their location has hindered their dog in whatever behavior they're trying to get their dog to do. So if they're too close to a jump, uh, then they may be pushing for a backside by accident. If they're too far away from an obstacle, then they're not in relative location for the dog to be able to, to uh, uh, commit to the jump, depending on, you know, the dog's uh, training. And so I'm constantly telling them, stop, don't move. Look at where you are. Look at where your feet are pointing. Look at where you are in relation to the obstacle, where you are in relation to your dog. Uh, and recognizing that they're either too far away from the dog's line or they're on the dog's line is so, so important. It so matters. That's for the natural part of, of dog training. So the natural cues and the natural location that help to indicate um, which, whichever obstacle they're going to or not going to. And then on top of that, have we trained the dog to do X, Y, Z? So for the rear cross, of, of the three crosses, front cross, blind cross, rear cross, the rear cross is the only one that requires an element of dog training and handler training. The front cross does too a little bit, but for the most part, it's much more natural than, than the rear cross. The rear cross requires training of the dog to go away from the handler and take whatever obstacle. So that is a purely trained behavior. It generally does not come naturally. And so recognizing how our location relative to the obstacle they're on, our location relative to the turn that we want matters. And our speed, our, our motion to the obstacle that we're at or, or going towards, how does that help or hinder our dog? And there's so many, many, many different scenarios that that we have to look at my my location is not helping my dog so what other cues can i train my dog to do to help override my location so i have handlers that that can't move that fast they just physically cannot move um, to stay in front of their dogs and in my opinion staying in front of your dog generally gives the most information for your dogs and so I'm the type of handler, I'm the type of trainer that I prefer to train having my, my handlers as much in front of their dogs to give maximum information on where the dog is required to go next. But there are many handlers of mine that cannot physically move forward. 
And so we have to recognize how their motion towards whatever obstacle we're heading towards, plus the verbal of the dog understanding the difference between jump and tunnel matters. And so training, dog training versus handler training. And when we have dog training happening, it really, really helps for handlers to work on dog training outside of class. So classes where I give you the information you need to then take it home and train it. Because uh, it's just not enough time in a group class. We could do more if we did privates, if we did uh, semi-privates even. But in a group class, training just once a week is not enough time. Well, it's enough time if you do it long enough. But it, it's not enough repetitions generally to get solid agility training unless you're also training them for it at home. And so, you know, for go outs, we train towards a, a target and teaching the dog that the word go means go forward and look for a target. And so if, if we've done that in class, then it requires handlers to then go outside of class and continue to work that. And I recognize that not everybody has jumps, not everybody has tunnels, and I recognize that, but there's a lot that you can do at a park with you know, one jump and a target plate, or two jumps and a target plate. There is a lot that handlers can do. There's a lot that I train in my living room. I push all my furniture to the edges, and me and the dog work in my living room on jumping work, on verbal discrimination, uh, and that's dog training. That is training my dog to do behaviors that are outside of natural behaviors. And that dog training helps me when I bring it back into a, an agility course. So it, you don't need a big space to do dog training. You just need to do the dog training part of it. I digress a little bit. The point of this podcast was to help owners recognize the difference between when you have a, 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 a dog training problem, when you have a handler training problem, and all the natural cues that are present at, at all times until the dog training overrides the natural behaviors or the natural cues. So let's, let's, let me recap on what are natural cues for a dog. So motion, either forward motion, backwards motion, sideways motion is a natural behavior for the dogs to cue or the dogs to follow. And the more uh, the more speed that you have in that motion, the more speed that your dog is going to have at, at, on course, the minimal speed or the no speed at all is a natural turning cue for the dog. So deselling will cause your dog to start to turn. As they overtake you, they will start to turn. Shoulders is a natural behavior, is a natural cue for our dog. So our, where our shoulders are facing, our dogs start to recognize um, either to drive forward. So if we're in front of our dogs and our shoulders are facing away from our dogs, so we're both driving in the same direction, but the handler is in front, then those shoulders are indicating to the dog, keep moving straight, keep moving forward. If our shoulders are turning towards our dog, if they're facing our dog, as in a front cross, then that is a natural turning cue. It's a natural collection cue. And we are then asking our dogs to naturally uh, start to turn into us as well. Uh, our location, our location in relation to our dog. So every dog has a, a bubble a natural bubble that they uh, move on the, move, move from the owner. So how do you know what your natural bubble is? 
go for an off leash jog with your dog. And if you know, obviously they have to know how to stay with you. Um, but go on a, a, a jog with your dog in big circles and you will see how big your bubble is. Do they run wide? Do they run close? Um, where are they? So you, the dog's on the outside of the circle and you're running in a jog, you know, looking at them, paying attention to them. How close or how far away are they naturally from you? That is their natural location from you. So that's natural. Dogs will stay generally within a range when they're in focus. And then another natural behavior for agility is how close am I to this obstacle? So the closer you are to an obstacle, you may be either cueing it um, or cueing the backside, depending on where you are in relation to the jump bar. So location is a natural cue. Um, eye contact is a natural cue. So you don't have to have staring at your dog eye contact, but they need to see your face to understand which side to be on, to understand if they're converging on your line um, or where you want them to head towards. So if you take your eyes off your dog and focus forward, then the dog's going to focus forward as well and not pay attention to which side you want just to go forward. And so the side that you want your dog on, you have to have some element of a side cue for them to understand which side to stay on. And then they have to learn the dog training part of the eye contact is once I put you on this side, stay on this side until cued otherwise. That is a dog training part of it because dogs will naturally go to the side you look for or you look at. And if you're not giving any sides, so if you're going straight forward, they'll pick a side until trained. So that is a dog training part of the eye contact. They naturally want to come to eye contact, but if you don't give them eye contact, then the trained part of it is stay on the side I put you on until a cue differently. Indirect eye contact is move uh, forward in front of me, whereas direct eye contact generally means collect into me. So come into me. So those are all natural cues versus your trained cues, which are uh, uh, verbals are not are not uh, natural. Those are trained. Hand signals are trained. Um, and then you have to add all of those in. And we use a blending of signals, right? We don't just use one cue to tell our dogs what to do on a course. We're constantly blending all these different cues together, the location relative to the obstacle, with a, a name call, with direct eye contact, those are all uh, can be turning cues. And then what are the cues for extension? So this is a big topic and we literally could, go, I could literally go on for days. I, I absolutely love this topic. Um, I love watching dogs respond naturally to their handlers. And then I love watching how the dog training part of it, the verbals kick in and, and how the, the verbals paired with, um, with the handler's location, how it, they're in direct opposition at times. And the dog training part of the equation takes over, which allows the handler to do all these amazing things in their, in other handling aspects of the course. So when you're running a course and you're coming across issues of an animal, a dog not taking an obstacle or getting the wrong obstacle or running big, look at the natural cues versus the trained cues. And then in relation to that, was the handler's timing of those cues effective? Because remember, it doesn't matter if the the behavior, if the cues are trained or natural, if the handler's not giving them at all, then the dog doesn't have a chance. They're going to do what they want to do. All right. I have a little puppy, not a puppy. She's four years old almost. That is sad that I am not in the kitchen with her. And she's just about to howl.
All right. And with my dogs howling in the background, I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. Please let me know if you have any questions about this or if my verbal des- description of these handling dog training makes sense to you. All right, I'm going to head out. Happy training. Woof, woof.